Well, as you know, as we've told you, we've, we're studying prayer here at Rooftop in our current series, OMG, what Jesus has to teach us about prayer. Jesus has a lot to say about this topic, a very important topic to him. To Jesus, prayer is the language of faith. It's how we communicate and connect with God, our Father. To pray to God, our Father, should be as normal and natural as a child, um, praying and interacting with his or her mother or father. In fact, that's Jesus' general paradigm when it comes to prayer. Prayer is when we, God's children, approach God, our Father, and tell him what we want and need. But there's another side of prayer that we shouldn't neglect when we talk about it. As much as Jesus emphasizes the informality and the intimacy of prayer as a conversation with our Father, he also makes sure to remind us that prayer is a privilege in which we enter the throne room of our King. God is holy and separate, the ruler of all creation. He is our divine king. As we saw from that episode of the HBO miniseries, John Adams, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's fantastic. As we saw from that, it can be and should be a bit intimidating meeting God Almighty, our king, in prayer. We should approach God as our father, but we must remember how much of an honor it is to be in the divine presence. It's why a lot of people, when they pray in the Bible, they actually pray flat to the ground with their face in the dirt, because they know that they do not deserve to be in the presence of God. Now, of course, this can create some tension in prayer. Relating to God as our daddy, but regarding him as our king, can be an awkward balance to maintain. In this regard, I'm actually reminded of another movie featuring more British royalty, The King's Speech. Anybody see that movie? In the movie, King George VI, played by Colin Firth, has just been made king after his brother abdicates the throne. Now he comes home from his swearing in with dressed in all his kingly regalia. Now his young daughters, he has two daughters at the time, one of them actually grows up to be Queen Elizabeth, and his young daughters are a bit confused at how to approach him. They know he is their daddy. I mean, he reads them stories at night and tucks them in, but suddenly overnight he is their king by divine right. And they don't know how to relate. They don't know how to maintain that balance. As it is, it's kind of cute. They get stuck between a hug and a a curtsy. Do I hug you or curtsy? I don't know. That's kind of how it is with prayer. To our Father, our King, we get stuck between a hug and and a curtsy. The word to remember here is humility. As informal and intimate as we can be with God, our Father, we must always pray to God, our King, with humility. That's one of the very important things that Jesus has to teach us about prayer. It's such an important lesson that I want to talk about it with you this morning, what it means to pray to God humbly. And in order to do so, I want to study together a story that Jesus tells in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's a story about humility and prayer. So let me go ahead and read it to you, and then we will discuss it. Although, really, we're not going to discuss. I'm actually going to talk, and you're going to listen. So, and Just so I don't raise your expectations. <laughs> I thought this was going to be a discussion. Luke 18, 9 through 14. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now here in this story, Jesus speaks of two people who went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. You know what Pharisees were. You know the reputation the Pharisees had. They were holy, righteous chaps. They were widely regarded and highly regarded by for their own righteousness and for their own holiness. They had single-handedly, by their own sheer will, left behind their lives of sin 
and committed themselves in devotion to God's law. So they were widely regard, highly regarded uh, for that. And sure enough, that is what the Pharisee prays here. He celebrates his own righteousness. He says, God, I thank you. I'm not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers. I fast twice a week. Give a tenth of all I get. woo Good for me. The other supplicant in the story is somebody that Jesus calls a tax collector. Now, tax collectors in Jesus' day and age, they were actually despised members of society. They were regarded as traitors to their own people. Tax collectors were Jews who had been recruited by Rome, the evil Roman overlords, to tax the Jewish people. So they were regarded by traitors, as traitors by their own people. They were also actually regarded as kind of greedy, conniving thieves who kind of took more than they should have. Regardless of that, the tax collector goes to the temple to pray. According to Jesus, he stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast, and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, those of us who have been around church know Jesus' point. We know who Jesus is commending in terms of pleasing God or being justified by God. As Jesus said, the tax collector wins the day. As Jesus says, I tell you that the tax collector, rather than the Pharisee, went home justified before God. By the way, to be justified before God, you might wonder what that means. Well, to be justified before God means to be made right with God. We're all wrong with God. We're all right wrong before God. And to be justified before God means to be made right. It's kind of like when you're typing a paper in college or high school, and you need to line up the, the lines on the right. You need to justify the margins. You need to line them up on the right. That's what it means to be justified before God, to be lined up with God on the right. And as Jesus, you like that, by the way? I like that. I remember that from years ago. So the power of a good metaphor and picture lodged in your head. Anyway, as Jesus says, I'll stop commending my own creativity. As Jesus says, the tax collector here, the tax collector here is the one who was justified before God. We know that's Jesus' point. But something you've got to remember when we study Jesus' parables is that the lesson is oftentimes more surprising than we think. In telling stories, Jesus is always trying to surprise his audience. One of my seminary professors in seminary uh, told me that what Jesus always does, he he does this thing he calls a parabolic pump fake. You know what a pump fake is? We're filled with sports metaphors here this morning. A pump fake is when a basketball player, even a quarterback, you know, pumps like he's going in one direction to shake off the defender, and then he goes in another direction. He kind of goes around the defender. So you think he's going this direction? Whoa! And he goes this direction instead. And Jesus clearly, you think he's going in one direction, and then he goes in another direction entirely. He surprises you. Now, we're familiar enough with this parable to know what Jesus' point is, but his original audience would have been thoroughly faked out. I know if Jesus had asked his listeners who was justified before God, the tax collector or the Pharisee, who would they have said? The Pharisee. How so? Well, think about it. I mean, the Pharisee's respected and righteous. He fasts twice a week, gives a tenth of his income, probably serves as an elder at his church, maybe he's given a significant contribution to the capital campaign. By contrast, the tax collector is a disreputable thief. I mean, how could God be pleased with him? It's simple, because while the Pharisee is proud and arrogant, the tax collector is humble. The Pharisee marches straight up to the temple, touts his own accomplishments, thinks he's better than everybody else. The tax collector stands at a distance. Did you notice that? He stands at a distance so as not to mar the holiness of God. He beats his breast in grief over his, all the terrible things he's done in his life, and he begs God for mercy, knowing that he has no chance to earn it on his own. Jesus' audience, and maybe even some of us, would think that the Pharisee is more justified before God. I mean, who's more likely to go to heaven? Think about it. Uh, uh, Let's say a monk or a murderer. Who's more likely to go to heaven? The monk. A a priest or a prostitute? Oh, the priest. A Pharisee or a tax collector? Well, a Pharisee. Why? Because he's got the resume. But that's the fake out. The tax collector, this terrible sinner, this thief, this publican, is actually justified before God because he's humble. And humility is the only proper attitude to have when approaching God in prayer. As Jesus says, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, just so we're clear, what is humility? Humility means to be low in rank and importance. It means to have a a modest, sober opinion of yourself with respect to other people and certainly with respect to God. When you hear the word humility, what do you think of? Here's the discussion component of our sermon. When you hear the word humility, what do you think of? What comes to your mind when you hear about humility? 
honesty, ashes. Ashes, that's actually what the word humility means. It means earth. Very good Stephanie Villagram this morning. When I think of the word humility, I think of the Teresa. I think of Jesus washing disciples' feet, of the dirt. I think of dandelions. I don't know why I think of dandelions when I think of humility. But. Uh, I think of Muhammad Ali in his later years. <laughs> Not in his early years. Muhammad Ali died this week. I don't know if maybe you haven't been paying attention at all. But he died this week, and he was not a, a humble man uh, in, in his early days. Uh, they called him the Louisville Lip because he was from Louisville, and he wa- was always talking about himself. He called himself the greatest, and he actually believed it. In fact, quick story about Muhammad Ali that you might have heard. One time, he, at the peak of his success, he was on an airplane uh, getting ready to go somewhere, and the flight attendant was walking around the airplane making sure everybody was buckled up so that they could take off. And the flight attendant got to Muhammad Ali, who did not have his seatbelt on, and said, I'm sorry, you need to put your seatbelt on so that we can leave. And Muhammad Ali said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And the flight attendant shot right back at him and said, Superman don't need no airplane. (laughs) (laughs) The younger Muhammad Ali was not necessarily humble, but the older Ali was. He had been humbled by Parkinson's. He had been humbled by age. He had been humbled by defeat. He was quiet and soft-spoken, eager to please. He had learned his limits. He had learned humility. When it comes to relating to God, the only proper attitude is that of humility. Why? Because it's how we actually stand in relation to God. God is holy and perfect. His greatness is incomprehensible, unspeakable, ineffable is the word that the philosophers use. Before him, we are like grass that dies in the sun. We are like flies that he swats away from his backside. He loves us. Of course he does. But not because we've amounted to anything before him. He loves us just because he loves us. And that's what humility is. It's having an honest appreciation of our standing before God. Now, what does all of this have to do with prayer? What does all this humility stuff have to do with prayer? It has everything to do with prayer. Because prayer is how we interact with our God. Prayer is how we communicate and commune with our Father. In prayer, we connect and communicate with him. And the only way to pray is humbly. That's the point of this parable. Those are the people that God promises to raise up. Those are the prayers that God promises to hear. As God tells the Israelites in the book of 2 Chronicles, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Humility is the only way to pray to God. Now, how do we do that? How do we pray humbly? By curtsying three times before the king, not looking him in the eyes? Maybe that will help. Like I said, a lot of people in the Bible, they actually did pray with their face in the dirt, so... Give it a try. But I do have a few other suggestions that might help us be more humble as we enter God's presence in prayer. And with the time I have left, that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, how to pray humbly to God our King. First, to pray humbly to God, we should confess our sins. Confess our sins. One of the primary reasons that we pray is to confess to God and tell him how sorry we are for the mistakes we've made. He's given us so much, and sometimes all we give back to him is our own selfishness and bad decisions. He has saved us from our sin, promised us life eternal, and we thank him by yelling at our children and cheating on our taxes. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus died so that we could be forgiven of these sins, of course. And if we believe that message in our heart, we can be saved. But... It's still necessary for us to fess up about what we've done. It's sort of impossible to move on with God without owning what we've done. If someone wrongs me, if I've wronged someone, it's kind of like the relationship is frozen until we deal with that. But that can be hard to do. Apologies can be hard to make. I mean, we all know people have a hard time making apologies. Anybody know anybody who just has a hard time saying I'm sorry? I'm sorry. It's hard to get their mouth to move in that direction. Do you know anybody like that? I saw one person back there. Is that person sitting next to you at all? 
We all know people like that. And if they do apologize, by the way, they offer up these half-hearted, conditional apologies. I am sorry if my actions offended you. Well, your actions deeply offended me, so you want to try that again? And it can be hard to fess up to God, too. I mean, we don't like being humble. We don't like dwelling on all the things we've done wrong. I don't know if you remember this quote. Donald Trump, several months ago, he actually said he never felt the need to apologize to God because that's just stuff that he kind of works out on his own. Good luck with that there. But here's the thing. We cannot appreciate the mercy of God unless we appreciate the depth of our sin. I mean, it's mathematically impossible to appreciate the mercy of God unless we appreciate the depth of our sin. And this is what the tax collector prayed. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's kind of like King David in the Old Testament. David was a murderous adulterer. David was a glorious king. He was also a murderous adulterer. And he got found out. And he knew, first things first, I got to smooth things over with God. So the first thing he does is confess his sins to God in prayer. As he writes in Psalm 51, words I hope you know, have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Yeah, God is our daddy, and he will love us always. He sent his son to die for our sins, but he is also our holy God. He is our king, and we owe him an apology for our crimes, an apology from the heart. In a moment, we're actually going to have a response time, and normally I just kind of get up here and blab a prayer. But let me give you a minute to make your own confession to yourself, to God, confessing your sins, admitting your crimes. You can be forgiven by God, but only unless you admit you need it. If we want to pray humbly to God, we need to confess our sins. Secondly, if we want to pray humbly to God, we should ask for help. When we pray humbly, we admit that without God in our lives, we are completely helpless. We seek an audience with God because without his help, our cause is lost. This is one of the differences between the Pharisee and the tax collector. I mean, the Pharisee thought he had no need of God. He went in sort of announcing everything that he had accomplished on his own. The tax collector knew his lot in life. He knew that he was a tax collector, a terrible sinner. Nobody liked him. Everybody thought he was a traitor. Nobody wanted to spend any time with him. He knew that he needed God's help. In fact, it is helplessness that oftentimes sends us to God in prayer. The psalmist prays in Psalm 10, Arise, Lord, lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. Sometimes we are completely out of options, and we have nothing else to do except to pray to God for help. I remember a story I heard a few years ago about that terrible F5 tornado that descended on Joplin, Missouri. When was that, 2014, 15? Or so. But a survivor was being interviewed uh, after the tornado struck, and a survivor was being interviewed by a reporter, and he was describing how absolutely terrified he was, hunkered down in his basement. He was this big, burly guy, nothing wimpy about him, but as this tornado screamed overhead, ripping his house from its foundations, he, he told the reporter, quote, he said, all I could do was pray like a sissy. That quote has stuck with me. I love it. All I could do is pray like a sissy. <laughs> All I can do is pray like a sissy. I mean, there are some of those situations in life where that is the only thing you know to do. All I can do is pray like a sissy. The divorce that's out of your hands. There's nothing you can do. All you can do is pray like a sissy. The cancer that is ravaging the body of your loved one. All you can do is pray like a sissy. Your children who are getting ready to leave and live life on their own. <laughs> All you can do is celebrate, applaud, <laughs> and pray like a sissy. I mean, these things, most of these things, should terrify us. But these are situations that send us to pray. In fact, it's kind of by design because ultimately we are all completely dependent on the help that God gives us. I mean, we, we think we're like powerful, we can do an awful lot with our lives, but then we like get to the end of our lives and we die. We're all helpless before him. Better we realize that early than on our deathbeds. These are 
situations given to us by God to help expose our need before him. And it's okay to pray like a sissy through them. I mean, maybe right now, in whatever way, you're hunkered down in your basement and some tornado, tornado, is just ripping apart your life. Pray like a sissy through that. Cry out in your helplessness humbly to God who alone can help you. If we want to pray humbly before God, our King, we should confess our sins, ask for help. And lastly, if we want to pray humbly before God, we should be ourselves. When we approach God humbly, we aren't afraid to be our real self. We aren't afraid to let him know who we are, what we really think, even if we're terrified that it might lower his opinion of us in the process. Because when we kneel before a holy, perfect God, we know that he knows. We know that he knows everything. As the psalmist writes in Psalm 44, God knows the secrets of the heart. And as David prayed, search me, God, know my heart, test me, know my anxious thoughts. Now, of course, even though we know God knows who we are, it can be difficult to be that person before God. It's kind of like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. After they eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they realize they were naked. Remember that? Oh, no, we're naked. Oh. And what did they do? They hid. Ran for the bushes. Head for the bushes. Now, why? I mean, they had seen each other naked. Nothing new there. And from what I could tell from the pictures, neither of them had anything to be ashamed about. <laughs> Just me. And also, as far as God's concerned, I mean, why try hiding from a God who, as far as they could tell, has x-ray vision? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, that's, that's kind of like a toddler covering his eyes to make you go away. I can't see you. You're gone. Well, I'm actually right there in front of you. No, you disappeared. Why hide from a God that we know can see everything? It doesn't make any sense. Well, we as people don't make sense. That's sort of what it means to be a human being. It means to not make sense. <clears throat> but we hide all the same. We hide so much from God. So much of who we are, so much of what we think. We hide our doubts about God. Is he real? Does he love us? Is he really coming back? Is the Bible really true? We hide our problems, our dysfunctions, our anxieties, our addictions, our money problems, our family problems. We hide our complaints. Why we're mad at God, why we can't stand him, why we want nothing to do with him right now. We hide our dreams, our desires, what would really make us happy, what we've always wanted in life. We hide our fears, our fear of the future, our fear of being rejected, our fear of death, our fear of loneliness, our fear of spending life alone, our fear of insignificance. We hide these things. Why? Well, a lot of us actually don't know them about ourselves. We're not necessarily the most self-reflective people, which is why David's prayer is so courageous. Lord, search me and know me. Show me to myself. But another reason we hide these things from ourselves is because we're afraid of what God would do if he found out. Deep in our souls, we know God is holy and perfect. We are, know that we're a tremendous disappointment to him. But God knows these things about ourselves. He sees every part of who we are. He created every part of us. Even in our sinful condition, he wants us to know that he sees us and he loves us and he accepts us. We know this for a fact because of what Jesus did on the cross. He sent his son to die for our sins, even in our sinful condition, so that we could live eternally, forever, with him and with each other. This is what Paul says. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, while we didn't make any sense, Christ died for us. So we have nothing to be ashamed of before him or each other. Unlike the Pharisee, we don't need to pretend to be anything we aren't before God. We can take to him all our dreams, all our fears, all our doubts, all our evil thoughts, knowing he accepts us exactly as we are. As C.S. Lewis said, we must lay before him what is in us, not what ought to be in us. Jesus took care of what ought to be in us. Jesus put his own righteousness inside of us. Our only obligation is to lay before him what is in us. That's what it means to pray humbly. It means to confess our sins, to ask for help, to be ourselves. 
That's the type of prayer God hears and answers. That's the type of prayer he justifies. He lines up on the right. In a moment, like I said, I'm going to lead us in our closing prayer. And before I pray, I'm going to give you a moment to humbly enter the throne room of God. Do your curtsy. Do your bow. Get your face in the dirt. Yes, God is our Father, but he is also our King. Bow your hearts before him. Take a moment to confess your sins. Unfreeze that relationship that exists between you and God right now. Come clean and pray like a sissy before him. Tell him in your desperation what you want, what you really need. And be yourself before him too. Lay it all out, all your questions, all your doubts, all your fears, all your dreams. Be yourself because of what Jesus does, did. He loves you just as you are. Let's go ahead and pray.